President Trump orders an increase in the number of visas for temporary workers, while ICE is targeting anyone here illegally for deportation. First two, now three, respected female biologists sue the Salk Institute for gender discrimination. And constant flooding causes tiny Imperial Beach to sue huge oil and coal corporations for damages. I'm Mark Sauer. The KPBS Roundtable starts now. Welcome to our discussion of the week's top stories. I'm Mark Sauer, and joining me at the KPBS Roundtable today, all from the San Diego Union Tribune, reporter Kate Morrissey, who covers immigration. Hi, Kate. Hi, good to see you. Good to have you back again. Science and technology reporter Gary Robbins. Hi, Gary. Hey, Mark. Glad you're back with us. And Joshua Emerson Smith, whose beat is the environment. Hi, Josh. Good to be here. Glad to have you today. Well, the Trump administration has declared this Made in America Week, the perfect time, it seems, to invite thousands more immigrant workers to the U.S. and for Trump's Mar-a-Lago resort in Florida to hire 70 foreign workers, claiming it can't find qualified Americans to serve as cooks, waiters, and housekeepers. Donald Trump has been full-throated in his disdain for immigrants. The center plank of Trump's America First platform is squeezing immigration in order to preserve jobs for American workers. That's why a move by the Trump administration this week brought harsh criticism from some of his conservative supporters. So, Kate, what was the action taken by the Department of Labor that Royal Trump World this week? Well, it was from the Department of Homeland Security okay. and Department of Labor together announcing that there would be an additional 15,000 H-2B visas, and those are for um, temporary non-agricultural workers to, to come to the U.S. and, and work for a, a short period of time. Okay. And what was the reason, main reason given for the invitation to hire more foreign workers? Uh, who was pushing the Trump administration on this? So the, in the announcement, they said that the need from some businesses could not be met by uh, American workers to do these temporary jobs. Um, they didn't say who specifically had been lobbying them, although they made several references to small businesses. So it seems like it may, that may have been one of the voices involved. Okay. And what sorts of jobs are we talking about? I alluded to a couple there in the open. Yeah, so um, landscaping, um, workers who come and work at the fair, so a lot of the folks up at Del Mar working the different food concessions and things like With that. With these visas, yeah. Yeah, um, tourism industry stuff like hotels, restaurants, um, the forestry industry, and construction as well sometimes, especially in places where construction is more seasonal, so not so much in San Diego. But. Okay, and what are critics saying about this move under President Trump, given his, uh, his whole platform during the campaign? Yeah, so some of the organizations that have been some of the fiercest supporters of his immigration policies were not happy with this decision. Minutes after it was announced, they took to Twitter criticizing it and, and saying that um, it was going against his promises to American workers and um, just sort of, they, they were very, um, I guess, distraught with the way the way that they they saw that going. But um, they also said that it was something that they've seen in the past with immigration policy, saying, OK, well, sometimes there are these compromises that happen with business and things like that. And the different sort of um, conservative viewpoints as far as emphasizing business versus emphasizing maybe the workers themselves and, and mm. all, all right. of that. Yeah, I was, Josh? I was wondering, is this like the normal ebb and flow of things? Um, so one of, the, one of the folks who I spoke with um, said that he has seen compromises like this happen in the past with immigration policy, even from those who would be taking a more um, strict leaning on it. I so see. He wasn't, he wasn't, I guess, in tears shocked about it, but mm. he was not pleased. <laughs> <laughs> now, you interviewed some San Diego employers about this, and what do they say regarding the criticism over cheap labor? That's what, uh, what the administration has, has taken some heat on. Yeah, so they're saying that when um, businesses bring in these workers that they're able to do it for a lower wage than if they were to pay American workers. And they say, well, if you offered more for the job, you'd probably find an American worker who would do it. Um, but the businesses themselves counter and say, well, this is temporary work, so Americans are not super inclined to take a job where they know they're not going to have a job in three, four, six, eight months, whatever. So the fair would be a good example. It's a short run, a matter of weeks, and you come in and you've right. got intense work for that time, but that's it. Exactly, or one of the other businesses I spoke to which does um, pumpkin and Christmas tree mm -hmm. sales, so they're very busy from Halloween to Christmas, and then the rest of the year they don't have a whole lot of positions open, so mm -hmm. um, they need workers to come in and help with that time. And for people who are coming from these, some of these countries that have weaker economies than the U.S., getting paid for that short amount of time on an American dollar is a good thing for them because it's a lot better than what they would make back mm -hmm. home. 
Gary? Is it really true that they can't find people to work at places like the fair? I keep hearing story after story <coughs> that high school students in particular can't find summer jobs. It's been a drumbeat yeah. for months now. Is it and true? That's, that's one of the criticisms that you hear from, from the folks who, who have been um, critiquing this particular policy, saying, well, why aren't they reaching out to all of the unemployed teens? I also heard, um, why aren't they reaching out to unemployed seniors mm -hmm. who are hoping to find work? Um, so that, that's definitely one of the criticisms that's been leveled here. Okay. Uh, I did want to, before I, I uh, switch to uh, the related immigration issue, uh, this has happened, in, been the norm in recent years under the Obama administration. They, they lifted this cap on temporary workers as well. Is this Trump running into reality here? You know, I think they wouldn't have done it without enough voices saying that it needed to happen because it is so different from what his policy has been to begin with. So there has to have been a push from somewhere for mm -hmm. this to happen. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right, let's switch to this related uh, immigration issue. You reported this week the number of immigration arrests in San Diego has jumped under Trump. What are the numbers? Yeah, so if you look at, um, since he signed his first immigration executive orders end of January, if you look at the numbers from then until the end of May, we're at about 500, close to 550 um, target arrests by the, the group that does like targeted enforcement. So where they say, okay, we're going after this particular individual because we believe that they need to be removed from the country as opposed to just sort of a scattershot grabbing someone off the street kind of idea. Um, and so previously, under the last two years of the Obama administration, those numbers were in the 200s. So we've seen them roughly double uh, in that time, back to levels from um, earlier in the Obama administration when he was um, doing a little bit more enforcement work and, and before he had sort of restricted the priorities on who enforcement could happen to. Yeah, they'd actually set uh, records for deportations, had they not, early in the Obama years. Uh, yeah, he was known as the deporter in chief for a right, long time. For a while. So Sorry? it goes way beyond criminals. Uh, I was reading your story and I was thinking it's not just criminals that they're targeting and I was wondering about the effect uh, uh, within the community. Yeah, so um, the executive order itself called out a couple of groups beyond just those with criminal convictions, um, which was Obama's priority was to say, okay, people with these particular criminal convictions are who we're going to target. Um, Trump's policy was to focus on those with <coughs> convictions, also those who were suspected of having committed the crime, so not necessarily someone with a conviction on the books, um, and as well as those who have prior removal orders. So if they've been before an immigration judge before and the judge said, you need to be removed from the country and they didn't leave, yeah. whether they have a criminal history or not, that's another focus of the administration. All right, and what kinds of checks and balances are in place regarding how ICE agents are operating in these arrests of immigrants? So part of that has to do with this idea of a removal order. So ICE can't just pull somebody and say, we think you're here without permission, you have to go back to your country now. The person has a right to go to a hearing before an immigration judge and have that determination made. So if they already have that order, that's when ICE can take very quick action. Otherwise, they're put into our immigration court system, which as you may know, has a pretty big backlog. Yeah, and they have, uh, they're, they're down in terms of appointments. They're just, they can't move them through very quickly at all, right? Mm -hmm. So um, coming back uh, full circle around, some of these visas we talked about, the temporary work visas at the top of this segment, uh, some of these folks likely to overstay their visas and fall into this category? <laughs> that is one of the concerns of the folks who are, who are leveling criticism at this, that they're, they're likely to, to stay. Um, it's a program that's been around for a long time. I don't know how many um, from that program are known to have overstayed their visas. We're still pretty... Um, rudimentary with our, our studies of visa overstays because if you leave on a land border it's not necessarily documented that that particular person left. We can track you if you leave by plane or by boat um, and we have some things being put in place especially by the new administration to start more of that tracking at our land borders but um, it's a little bit hard to follow. Okay. Well, it, go ahead. Yeah, isn't it um, the overstaying of visas that's one of the major contributors to illegal immigration as I understand it? Yeah, so it's, it's a combination of people coming without permission and then people staying longer than they're supposed to. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, well, this is not an <laughs> issue that's going away. I'm sure we're going to have many more bites of the apple on this show. We're going to move on. We're used to seeing promising stories emanating from the Salk Institute about scientific breakthroughs. But there was news of a different sort this week as first two and then three female scientists sued the venerable institution, which was founded by polio vaccine pioneer Jonas Salk. And Gary, who are the scientists uh, who, who sued? They've been there a long time and they're well known. They are, all three women are very prominent. Uh, Beverly Emerson, uh, Vicki uh, Lundblad, and Catherine Jones. In fact, Dr. Lundblad is a member of the National Academy of Sciences. You have to be elected. It's one of the most elite scientific organizations in the world. Um, 
So um, Jones and Lundblad sued the Institute last week and Dr. Emerson uh, this week. They're all claiming essentially the same thing, that they're not being paid fairly uh, when it comes to uh, pay and to promotions and not being allowed to have the same access to grants and leadership opportunities. They're also, um, two of the scientists have been there for 30 years. One of them has been there over a decade. They have said that this is a, a problem that they've repeatedly brought up with the Institute. Um, there were studies in 2003 and two, uh, 2016 that we haven't seen yet, they haven't been released publicly, that um, the lawsuit says has pointed out there's a problem and you're not dealing with it. Mm -hmm. uh, the Salk Institute responded in a very, very strong way. Um, in the first uh, case with Jones and Lundblad, the um, president of Salk, uh, Elizabeth Blackburn, came out and directly said, that these were women who were not performing the same level of work, the same quality work as some other scientists, and they weren't publishing in the uh, same top journals. And that was a fascinating part of your story, and I'm gonna get into the detail on that in just a minute, but before we do, we have a clip here from, from the Union Tribune, first uh, Victoria Lund Lundblad and then Catherine Jones explaining why they yeah. filed this suit. It really came down to, I, I was just keeping quiet about stuff I just felt was so wrong and I'd sort of lost respect for myself. It, that's what I meant when I said, I just couldn't not do this at a certain point. That was the tipping point. And I thought, really am I going to step away from my science, which is at the, right. the peak of, of almost there on an incredible story in order to fight this. And I thought, I have to, and I thought to myself, my first thought was, you're gonna get scooped and you're gonna lose this whole thing. And I thought, and if I don't, I'm going to be made extinct. All right, sounds like they're pretty reluctant uh, legal warriors here, and it just, it just came to a head for them. It did. I talked to them, and I, I pressed them on the matter of why now, and what did it take to get here, and both had been reluctant, but they both told me they felt like if they didn't do it, they really would regret it for the rest of their life. Mm -hmm. I, and, I haven't what, had time to, yet to talk to Emerson. Okay, and, and that's, that's who was just filed right. later this week. Yeah, so what are the alleges going on itself? How do they say the dis, uh, discrimination? You, you, you mentioned some of that here. There's, the grant money isn't going around there. They're so the Salk Institute has been getting a great deal of private uh, donations, like from the Helmsley Trust, they've gotten over $60 million. Dr. Lundblad says, hey, we didn't get any of that. They've also said things like uh, they've made it difficult for women to get in front of the uh, fundraising operation at the Salk or for getting the right to directly go to foundations and apply for money. So they're saying that there are opportunities to apply for money that they need to operate robust labs just aren't there, mm -hmm. particularly as it uh, compares to men. Mm -hmm. and, you, and you said uh, earlier before I went to that clip that Salk has uh, kind of an unusual pushback on this and then they got criticized for reacting to these women. What happened in that instance? Well, an institute like the Salk, it's almost unheard of, or at least in my experience, for them to come out and question the quality of work of someone. So to come out and say, these people are not performing at the top rate and they're not publishing in the in the, at the, in the same top journals uh, was rather extraordinary. They got immediate bl uh, blowback from that, and some of the strongest blowback came from uh, Carol Greider at Johns Hopkins. She's a Nobel laureate. She knows Lundblad very well. And Greider and Blackburn shared the Nobel Prize. Uh -huh. So these people know each other. Yeah. And, um, so that carried a lot of weight with did. Greider. And Greider and, said and you beautifully set up our clip here, and that's a nice <laughs> segue here. Let's hear from, <laughs> let's hear from her. I understand that institutions, you know, once you get a lawyer involved, they're going to need to protect themselves. Um, but the real surprise was that they wanted to somehow disparage the quality of the science of the two scientists that came forward. That's what I would not have expected. All right, and again, you said uh, she carries a lot of weight, but a uh, Nobel laureate. And she's not the only one. A whole bunch of scientists, major figures from Johns Hopkins, uh, Harvard University, parts of the University of California are coming out and saying, you're not only doing something that amounts to character assassination, but you're focusing on something that may not be that important. Like they're saying, well, these uh, women, in particular, these two women didn't publish in the top journals for 10 years. But there's a lot of um, uh, debate over whether that should be a metric at all. Mm -hmm. Some uh, scientists uh, produce papers slowly over time that have great impact. Others produce a lot of papers that have very little impact. So is that really a guideline to go by? And then there were some criticisms I, I noted in your, in your coverage that uh, even that could be an old boys network where women don't get the opportunity to publish uh, as often as men in some of these instances. That, that's very true. There have been studies that have talked about that. And when I'm, when I'm hearing this, I'm hearing what's being said across the United States. And I think of the case of Nancy Hopkins at MIT about 20 years ago where she was making similar 
uh, accusations, and she even went to the point of measuring her lab to say, I don't get as much space as others. Mm -hmm. MIT under, undertook a major study, like, is it true or is it not true? And in the end, they found that most of it was true, mm -hmm. and the institute president came out and said, we're wrong. Mm -hmm. In this particular case, the Salk is going, just saying, well, this is not true, and they're being dismissive of at least two of their uh, scholars. Now, we don't know what's true. Mm -hmm. It hasn't gone through the court, but uh -huh. there, there's real confrontation here. What's the, I mean, Kate can certainly testify to this, and all of us who have been in newspapers, a lot of women in, in certain fields, like newspapers and, and, uh, and certainly broadcast news, but, but what is it among scientists? Is it still mostly a, a man's profession? You know, it's, uh, uh, when it comes to doctors, women earn more than half of all doctors in science, and so in the early part, they do well, but the pipeline narrows for a whole bunch of reasons that haven't been worked out. So many women uh, leave for a period of time to have children, for example, mm -hmm. and that slows down their careers in some cases. Mm -hmm. But the field of science still has not really figured out how to deal with this, uh, and a lot of people question whether science wants to deal with it. Is this, is this really likely to go to, uh, to trial? I mean, can we really see this aired with discovery and all, lots of details and all? Or well, what do you Dr. Think? Emerson, in the lawsuit that came this week, said she wanted a jury trial. I don't know what will happen, and I'm wondering about something else. All three women are in their 60s. Mm -hmm. um, that doesn't mean they're at the end of their career. The Salk has people in their 70s that are doing extraordinary work. But are they trying to press an issue? Is Do they want a settlement, or do they want something else? Do they, is this a matter of changing entirely how the Salk Institute is, is operated? Yeah. And we're going to see... Gonna, I was going to ask, yeah. actually, you know, like, is this a, an effort to kind of influence the larger institution, right? Like, there's been some social science that says that the institution may be, or the people at the top may be somewhat oblivious to the institutional sexism, if that is the case. I think what the most important thing will be in the coming days is to see how everybody reacts to President Blackburn. She got a lot of blowback blow back for being so hard, but in other times, she, that's, she talks a lot about the need to get women in. So there will be questions about her leadership style. Was this a way to do, you know, to cut people off at the knees? Was that the right strategy to do? So there will be questions about whether she's following the kind of the right yeah. path at this point. Maybe that response will evolve and, and see what happens yeah. as we go along. Fascinating. It'll be some interesting follow-ups as we, as we move along with that story. Well, the idea of making those who enjoy enormous profits from burning fossil fuels pay for the damage they cause has found a new champion in Serge Dedina, the mayor of Imperial Beach. IB is joining with uh, San Mateo and Marin counties, three areas vulnerable to flooding from rising seas, in a lawsuit against several huge oil and coal conglomerates. Uh, Just start by telling us about these lawsuits here. Uh, who are they against and what are they alleging? All the major oil and, and coal companies in the world, really, okay. you know, from Exxon to ConocoPhillips, you know, to Shell. I mean, everyone's named pretty much. All the names you've all heard of. You've all these heard of yeah. these names, right, exactly. And so what they're saying is that we have a special injury and that uh, so we need to be compensated as a local government municipality for the cost that we will incur for this special injury. It's a public nuisance lawsuit. And that injury is uh, sea level rise and coastal flooding. Not necessarily large storms that are going to be rolling through, but just high tides, king tides coming through and, and flooding homes, flooding uh, government infrastructure, and then all of the costs associated with dealing with that. And they filed this in Superior Court, State Superior, not in Federal three, Court. Three different lawsuits, all in their local uh, Superior Courts, and um, that's for some technical reasons, some okay. lawsuits that uh, were trying to bring similar claims on um, federal grounds, on, on uh, yeah, fe in, in federal, federal court, law. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, well, yeah, it, you could bring federal case, you could bring state law cases in federal court, mm -hmm. but basically saying that, yeah, this is a, um, this is on state law grounds. Okay. Now, uh, we do have uh, Imperial Beach uh, Mayor. He, uh, he came in and he talked about some of the damage and expense caused by the flooding with our KPBS producer, Pat Finn. And here's what uh, Serge Dedina had to say. A couple of years ago, we had the worst flooding that we've ever seen on our bayfront. Historic flooding, the entire bayshore bikeway along our bayfront was under water. So we know what we've experienced and the big issue that we have to deal with is actually moving our infrastructure inland so for example we have a sewer line along seacoast drive that will be covered 90 percent of it will be covered with water into the future with rising seas so we've got to move that sewer line a block inland that's going to cost over 10 million dollars 
And $10 million is a big deal in a, a small city like Imperial Beach, right? Sure, yeah, and scientists say sea level rise is already contributing to flooding and you know it's only gonna get worse. We don't know how much worse uh, places like Marin County and San Mateo County specifically have done vulnerability studies where they show projections into the billions, you know, going out, you know, the next century or so in terms of damages and costs. Mm -hmm. And we've, Gary, go ahead. Are there other cities in the county that are going to join in this? Uh, probably not at first. Um, Imperial County, uh, Imperial Beach is the, is probably the most impacted city in the county or is definitely going to be the most impacted under the current predictions. Um, if they prevail, and this will obviously take some time, the thinking is that other cities from around the country may want to follow up with similar lawsuits. And it really could. This is considered an uphill battle, with, but with radically large implications. So other places like Miami, Charleston, South Carolina, Boston, they might all want a, a piece of this type of lawsuit as well. It is, Okay. What do you think their their end goal is? Like, what what do they realistically realistically think they're going to get out of going through with this? Yeah. So there's there's a couple of different scenarios there. One is a lot of these types of lawsuits settle. So maybe they want a a settlement to actually just pay for this. Another situation is that they want to get to discovery because a big piece of this lawsuit would be finding out how much these oil companies knew and when. Part of the claim is that they knew their own industry scientists had known as early as the 70s and 80s that they knew that fossil fuels were going to contribute to climate change and that they didn't speak out or take appropriate action. Yeah, so it's a powerful tool, is it not? I mean, you saw that in the uh, big suits against the tobacco companies where their own research showed how harmful it was and it's, it seems analogous. And there's a lot of parallels being drawn <clears throat> between the tobacco lawsuits and this one and there's been some investigative reporting that's happened in the last uh, couple of years that have brought some of this out and exposed specifically what these internal studies were documents and, yeah. yeah, from Exxon. And yeah. so that's kind of opened the door a crack and given them what they think is the leverage to force this thing forward. Mm -hmm. And then if it goes to the discovery process, we may see a, a lot more information mm -hmm. exposed about what they knew and, and when. All right, in that interview with, with our Pat Finn of KPBS, uh, she asked uh, Dadina what he thought the chances were of success. Let's hear that. You know, our chances are no worse than what we're facing now. We have no capacity to pay for what's coming at us with rising seas. And so, you know, the reality, David did beat Goliath. And, you know, the other issue is you just never mess with Imperial Beach. <laughs> you don't mess with Imperial Beach. All right, we'll leave <laughs> that last word to him. We're going to turn to a related topic, and that was the passage this week of Governor Brown's cap and trade bill, the idea of making fossil fuel companies pay for the pollution they cause. It once enjoyed bipartisan support here. Nowadays, not so much. California, a different story from the rest of the country. How does California's cap and trade program work? How does it work? Yeah. Uh, you get um, credits. Some of them you buy in an auction. Some of them are given away for free if you are a major polluter. Um, and then you, if you don't use them, you can trade them. Mm -hmm. But you, it basically accounts for all the pollution from large sources in California. And then over time, those credits are ratcheted down, uh, phasing out the amount of pollution that can be emitted mm -hmm. in the state. And this was a battle in Sacramento because the Democrats enjoy just barely a supermajority, which was, was needed here, but uh, eight Republicans crossed over at the last minute to support Governor Brown. So it's a bipartisan situation. Yeah, so they didn't necessarily need a supermajority, but the previous cap-and-trade program was challenged as a, um, as a tax. tax. And said, they said, well, you need a two-thirds majority to, pa to pass this, right? Now, they lost that lawsuit. The California Supreme Court declined to hear it. However, since then, um, I believe it was Prop 26, I hope I'm getting that right, um, that expanded what it means, what a, what a tax is in California. And so the governor was afraid, if they didn't get the two-thirds majority, that this could be challenged again. Mm -hmm. So they wooed a lot of industry folks and uh, Republicans into supporting this. Mm -hmm. And that frustrated some of the environmental justice groups. But in the end, you know, Brown worked his magic and, and again a, got to the two-thirds majority for this. A, a big compromise. Gary? So this is likely to be the most important piece of legislation in the Brown era. 
I mean, you know, there's a, a lot of legislation in the Brown era, but I mean, it's it's a big piece of the fight against climate change for sure. Um, the criticism has been that it hasn't really reduced emissions all that much, but the real reductions would be seen in the next decade as the cap gets ratcheted down. So far, it's just raised a lot of money for the bullet train and other programs. And that's why they wanted to extend it out so far exactly. because it takes time for you the gotta effects to- You gotta extend it out if it's gonna do anything because you gotta ratchet down the credits. Right. And, and we have a very ambitious, San Diego does as well, but California has a very ambitious uh, climate action plan here and this so is this, a critical element. Yeah, right? so this played into the negotiations. Basically what the Democrats said was, we're trying to help you ratchet down the emissions in the most cost-effective way possible. If you guys block cap and trade, we go to what's called command and control, which is basically the air board just saying you gotta reduce emissions in, in this way, in very kind of like harsh, austere ways, which could cost industry a lot more. Okay. So that was the argument there, that actually this is the most efficient way to ratchet down these emissions is through what's called a market-based approach. All right, we'll have to leave it there. We're out of time, but it's a fascinating story and uh, big news out of Sacramento this week. Well, that wraps up another week of stories at the KPBS Roundtable. I'd like to thank my guests, all from the San Diego Union Tribune, immigration reporter Kate Morrissey, science and technology reporter Gary Robbins, and environment reporter Joshua Emerson-Smith. A reminder, all the stories we discussed today are available on our website, kpbs.org. And this week's Roundtable is also available as a podcast. I'm Mark Sauer. Thanks for joining us today on The Roundtable.